Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so thrilled today to be talking to some of the incredible team members from Gaslit. We are joined today by Robbie Pickering, who is the creator, showrunner, executive producer, and writer, Shay Wiggum, who plays G. Gordon Libby in the series, Amelia Gray, who is a writer for the series, Matt Quayle, who's the composer, Daniel Novotny, who's the production designer, Joe Leonard, who is the editor, Susie DeSanto, who's the costume designer, and Larkin Seeple, who's the director of photography for the series. And Robbie, I wanted to start with, with a question for you because, you know, obviously this is a narrative retelling of a moment in, in time and history. And, and so obviously within that, there's always research into factual information, and then there's creative freedom and interpretation, especially when you're looking at conversations that happened behind closed doors. What were the intimacies of relationship dynamics that weren't in the public eye? Um, and at the same time, it's interesting because obviously audiences know it's not a documentary, but they also may be watching it through the lens of, of kind of a documentary of, in terms of fact of what they're seeing on screen. And so how did you kind of wrestle with, with those different ideas of, of fact and fiction to find where it was important for the details to remain very on point and where it really worked and lent itself to the story to have that creative freedom for yourself and the team? Well, I think first you have to be like really inside the material. Um, everybody's heard this a million times, but I've been a Nixon geek and a Watergate geek since I was very young um, and uh, kind of one of those annoying people that will always bring everything about around the Nixon and, and the culture around Nixon. So when you're inside that and you really know a world and you're, you're as much of a geek about a historical world as I am about uh, the Nixon administration and that general period and the beginning of movement conservatism, you, 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 you kind of get a sense of what, what facts are kind of like guardrails. Like you can't, you can't violate this thing um, or, 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 or um, what, what, you know, um, what kind of, what, what, what kind of lies would be offensive to you? Um, what kind of stretching effect would be offensive to you as a Watergate geek? But at the same time, you've got to balance that with um, the truth. And, and I, I distinguish between the facts and the truth because the facts are, we didn't want to do some Wikipedia uh, rundown of all this stuff. I mean, we started out uh, the show saying, hey, let's write this for people who couldn't give a, shit about Watergate, you know, people who don't care. And uh, the thing that has to be interesting is the truth of why people did things and the relatability of those people and, and the drama that comes from that relatability. And that's what we really care about. And that's what, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, that's where my filialty lies. That's where, that's where Amelia it, uh, has written a lot about this, uh, not about this subject, but she wrote a, gr a great novel called Isadora about Isadora Duncan that goes different places with their story, but always maintains the truth of who she was. I'm a big fan of uh, Joyce Carol Oates wrote a couple of books uh, called Blonde and um, Zombie, one of which is about mm -hmm. Marilyn Monroe and one of which is about Jeffrey Dahmer. Now, especially Blonde, it goes to some places that that are not factual, but they're truthful somehow. And uh, people who you would always think similarly about there. <laughs> Jeffrey <laughs> Dahmer and Marilyn <laughs> Well, yeah, <laughs> a little bit. Um, but you know, I, I I think that I think that our 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 responsibility is to to the truth. And and you know, the other thing is when people you know watch a watch a you know documentary or 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 they they read a wikipedia article or something like that there's usually a big focus on objectivity but with 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 our with, with this story and with any story we do we feel that our duty as artists is to provide a point of view on the material and and actually the most boring thing you could do would be to be totally objective about it so it's a different set of requirements that you have to navigate in something like this. yeah although i'll also say that when we were researching it down and writing it i was always thinking of rick perlstein who is the original nixon geek and, <laughs> and <laughs> no, he's, many books our the hero. he's a producer on this project yeah go yeah ahead. he's incredible and and when i was when we were writing it it was like uh is rick gonna be annoyed if we say it like this is rick gonna rick is gonna say like actually it was it was a little bit different so <laughs> we we 
I, I think Robbie's right. We depart for the the sort of ecstatic truth of the thing, you know, and we we stick to it when we can. But also it was like, I want to make sure that we have Martha's apartment on the seventh floor because that is where it was, because Rick will be like, I see you. You got it wrong. Yeah, it's it's nice putting little things in there that the the Watergate geeks among us will like pick out and and know that we know the material. And, and and know that when we stress the truth or exaggerate things, we're doing it for a reason rather than just haphazard. And Rick Perlstein, by the way, wrote Nixon Land and the East and the Invisible Bridge and and uh, Barry Goldwater uh, book called Before the Storm. He's like one of the premier inspirations for the project and one of the premier historians. And we were lucky enough to have him. And he was never. Um, disturbed by any of the exaggerations as long as it remained ecstatically true which is as long as it remained emotionally true I, lo I love all of that and and to that point as well for you Amelia you know in the writer's room you're also building out characters that were much less at the foreground of the story so if we look at Beth Betty Gilpin's character Mo you know that's someone mm -hmm. where you're you're given a lot more latitude in terms of the freedom of who was this person you know what are a mm -hmm. lot of her characteristics and traits and and so what was that journey of determination of really figuring out those aspects in that regard but in a way that still fits into the world of characters that are very real and true to life as well. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Mo because I, I, I love writing the character and she's a really interesting, she was a really interesting person and character to research and write about. She, uh, she co-wrote a book with Hayes Gorey, who was a, a pretty dry Time Magazine journalist uh, about her life back in the 70s. And it is not a, it is not a gripping book, uh, not a super thrilling book. Uh, but as you, if you read between the lines on that book, it's, there's a really fascinating woman underneath there, you know, who, who was living in California and living a different, a really different life and kind of in the social scene and, and going out dancing, partying, you know, being an extremely fun sounding 20 something and, and then made a decision to come and, and date and, uh, uh, this, this, you know, DC climber in John Dean. And, you know, uh, she's, she's really interesting. And, and our writer's room was, was stacked with really great uh, writers and, and really great female writers who really wanted to make a character that was, that was well-rounded in Mo. You know, a character that, if you look back at Watergate, my mom remembers Mo Dean as, you know, the woman sitting behind John Dean wearing these pearls and this dress and, you know, just, just so so beautiful, looking looking so polished, and 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 when when I look at a character like that, it's like okay, what what is she really like? What's going on with with her? So building her out, it was a lot of you know filling in filling in kind of reading between the lines, bringing in stuff that 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 uh, that wasn't in the authorized biography, but which we found in other places. There's another great book called Women of Watergate. Um, which was written by by journalists, uh, female journalists at the time, who pull in all the wives and girlfriends and 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 build it out even more. And then you get um, you get Frances Liddy, uh, you have you have Mo, you have a plenty of Martha in that book. Uh, there's Howard Hunt's wife, who was really interesting, Dorothy. Uh, and so so it's like writing these characters, writing an ensemble is a chance to just dig in everywhere you look to a different weird strange interesting character yeah it really is and you know talking of character Shay you're playing this really fascinating guy in regards to the fact that there's a lot of rigidity to his convictions he's someone who seems very certain of what he believes what sort of choices and actions he's going to make and kind of the truth that he constructs for himself within that um, and I was interested in kind of the artistic freedom that comes with that and how if you have a real sense of the types of choices that a character is going to make from the beginning if it's kind of a little bit of a reverse in a way to then walk backwards and go well how did he get there you know what is it from his childhood that created this sort of structure within his mind and, and these types of rigid convictions that he has in the world uh, I think you hit it right on the head there. Um, I think it's, it's all comes back to a deep insecurity. He's deeply insecure. And he talks about that in Will from the, you know, afraid of lightning and he strapped himself to a tree with a belt in a, in a lightning storm. And then he thought 
I did that so I, I've overcome rats, the same thing. With, uh, that's our kind of a, you know, line in our piece. And um, so it's a deep insecurity, and that, that informs everything in Gordon. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, you, you do. You start there. And, uh, he is. He's the ultimate zealot. He's the ultimate, um, you know, for the, for the cause, you know. Um, and that, that's, where, that's where I started. I mean, it, it was interesting to me. I didn't really realize how deeply insecure he was. When I, because all we see is, you know, Miami Vice. We see that he wants to be an actor. We see that he says that I could have been an opera singer had I chosen to do that. I could have gotten him. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? So with Liddy, I remember talking to Matt, like, we have the truth and then we have Liddy's truth. You know what I mean? And I, I, I don't know if he truly did strap himself to the top of the tallest tree that is in, in his neighborhood, but we went with that, you know? So, you know, so yeah, it was, that's what made him fascinating. I think that Robbie and Amelia, uh, when I first took a look at it, uh, the, the, the all eight, I think they just, they knocked it out of the park, uh, speaking for, Lydia, for the whole thing, but, but they've just knocked it out of the park because Liddy is a, he's, he could very easily uh, become a, a, a caricature, you know, and you got to go to those places, that petulant child when he's uh, laughed out of gemstone to that ultimate killer, if he needs to be. And that, then that comes back to the, the thing we were exploring the whole time. What is your line? What's your line that you just won't cross? You know what? I'm not going to go there. But Liddy, I think, as long as he's seen by the king, as long as he's seen by Richard, that's all he wants in life is just to be seen, you know, which comes back to the insecurity. Absolutely. And, and coming over to some of the music composition in the series, Mac, I was interested in, in that initial process and journey of really finding the sound of a series, because it's not just as simple as looking at the early scenes in the first episode and figuring out what sort of sound you want for that. It's like, what are the sounds that we're going to keep coming back to for certain emotional tones throughout the series, certain narrative beats, certain character things. So even, you know, I think I've heard you say that you use like a lot of marimba for John Dean, you know, that's a recurring element throughout. And so so how do you kind of play around with different possibilities, different instruments at the beginning to really figure out what are those moments that we're going to kind of revisit throughout the series against the overarching idea of what the tone should be? Well, there's, you know, it, it always starts with uh, some conversations, you know, like talking with Robbie and Amelia about the tone that they imagine the music can help bring to the, to the show. And, and, and then I come up with some, some very, vague rules that I'm going to try to implement. And, you know, we started with, we don't want to make it sound like the seventies. Um, we don't want to make comedy music, even though there's a lot of humor, there's a lot of funny moments in the show. Um, real instruments seemed like it would be the right thing. Shouldn't be electronic. And, um, and, and then that's, you know, that, be, that, that starts my palette of, of instrument choices. And I, and I start writing music and trying to find, uh, find these tones that will help tell these, these stories, because that is ultimately always the job of the composer to, to help tell the story, to give the filmmaker what they need to, to tell the story. And I would write music and then we would all get together and uh, listen to it. And um, everyone was such great collaborators. It was, a, I, I thought, a wonderful experience. We'd sit there and go through all the music and we had it all separated in elements and Robbie and Amelia would be like, yeah, well, this is great. Why don't we take this element out and put this one in? And, and then it just starts to evolve. And uh, like there wasn't a conscious idea at first that the marimba would be with John Dean, but it worked. And so we just kept we kept going with it. And um, there was an initial cue written for, for Martha that featured strings and a, and a very sad violin and that, and that worked and we kept, and we kept going with that. So um, it's really, you know, I'd like to tell you that we figured it all out and I had a plan right from the beginning, but it was, it's very uh, an evolution uh, from some, some simple, some simple ideas. Yeah, no, it's it's such a great soundtrack to the series. And, and coming over to the production design with you, Daniel, you know, similar to the way that that Robbie and Amelia were talking about 
that latitude of, of, of fact versus creativity, you know, one of the details that reflects that is like, you know, Martha's home being a reflection of her as a character and the choices that she would have made design wise versus necessarily being specifically true to exactly what their home looked like. And so again, similarly, what was some of that research looking at archival photo, photos and footage and, and locations that you really wanted to have to reflect those images that people sometimes even know at the forefront of their mind and where you wanted to really use that freedom as a, an expression of character and to tell us more details about them. Yeah, I think, well, um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we did a lot of research and Life Magazine did a whole spread on the, the Watergate apartments and, and the Mitchell's home. And I didn't know much about Martha Mitchell, to be honest with you. I didn't know much about this whole project before I started, but, you know, I'm a chameleon. I got to get involved and research it and figure it out. And like, we're all filmmakers, right? So that's what we do. But um, yeah, with her home, her, her real home was, um, it wasn't as exciting as we wished it was, I think, when we really got into it. So we have a piano. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's exciting in a really to- terrible, horrifying <laughs> <laughs> kind of way. Yeah. You made it exciting in a beautiful way. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we had to, um, so we had to f- find that line. That, that, that set in particular was one of the, I think we tweaked the, the reality of it more than most of the other environments. And that was because we were in there the most. And, you know, it just gets boring if you're on one story and you don't have multiple levels for people to put their cameras and, you know, Larkin would agree to that, right? You know, he wanted to have various angles, which I really think that the, the lensing on this show is spectacular. They frame the apartment. It's featured so well. It's lit so well. It just looks great, um, which you just wouldn't have in the real apartment. I think you can Google it and and, and you'll be bored pretty fast. Um, and the other apartments, it's so interesting in the 70s, right? What things, how thing, how architecture developed in that time frame in the, er, in the early 70s, right? It's It was um, in this, in the early 70s, in this conservative world, of Republicans in Washington D.C., it wasn't. They weren't. They weren't stylish. It wasn't what you you you'd think it would be. So, um, you know, another example of that came when we were scouting and th- I, locations that I thought were interesting, and then Robbie would say, "No, no, no, that's wrong. Like, we want it's got it. It's not right." And so when we'd hone in on what it really was, like like, <laughs> like the Republican Party in California at that house, I remember. Yeah, we went to that one house and I hated it. And then when Robbie started to get into, it, I was like, oh. Oh, I like it now. I kind of, <laughs> we didn't shoot yeah. there. It was a different house, but you remember that one in Malibu? And had to yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's like, you want, you want everything to look like Mad Men, but it's like, well, these are yeah. Republicans in the seventies. They're not, they're not the, we had to, we had to make everything. I mean, I'm sure Susie can speak to this with the, with the costumes. We had to make it a little more stylish than they were actually wearing, because I think, I mean, I think if it was what they were actually wearing in the places they actually were, it would be, it would look like, um, like a, like a very sad Todd Salons movie or something. It would, it, it would look like very, very, very depressing. Yeah. Um, so we had to, we had to razz it up a little or, or juice it up. I'm what now a imagining you- Todd Salons making gasless. Gas <laughs> yeah, <like. laughs> exactly. I would love to see that though. A simple example of the research was we were talking props about what people were eating at the parties, right? What, what would what would they be eating? And so well, that's a good question, Matt. Uh, what Matt had the question and fair question. And so it's like they're eating trifles, the, the jello molds with the marshmallows in them, <laughs> <laughs> right? Or the or the weenies and hot dog weenies. And he was like, this is this is what this is what was going down. <laughs> it was a different and the, and the drinks in the in the in the when Mo and you know, that you know they're they're a couple of it's a good I mean yeah the research definitely played out um we, we tried our best so yeah. you know and and Susie in regards to the costumes as well I mean you've created these really fascinating and, and interesting and beautiful trajectories in terms of, of costume with different characters. You know, we were talking earlier about Mo sitting behind, you know, John in the courtroom and what she looks like there is very different to when they go on her first date, you know, and I was interested as well in like the costumes of Martha because she's this very strong conservative woman existing in a world of alpha males. And so there's parts of her that are trying to blend into that world. And yet there's also still the femininity is still always there with her, um, you know, and you have that starting point of that real stoicness that comes across 
across in her costumes and more rigid lines. And then what it looks like is kind of the shapes and the fabrics changed a little bit as she goes through some of her mental decline from everything happening to her. Well, you know, I mean, first and foremost, as the costume designer, the most important thing is that the costumes support and tell the story. So um, Martha, particularly, I mean, she was quite a peacock, actually. She spent a lot of time and effort on her appearance and her clothes and her hair and her nails and her makeup. And she always over accessorized. But, you know, she was somebody who was like in a lot of psychic pain. And Julia and I talked about that a lot. Like, it's really fun to do all the jewelry and the flash and all that sort of stuff. But then really, I mean, this is a woman who is in a great amount of pain. And so we had to reflect that in her costumes as her life like literally unravels right in front of her as she's being gaslit by basically the Republican establishment and the press and her husband. So, you know, it doesn't work if the costumes don't take go with the actor's performance. And so that, you know, with, with all of the actors, I mean, with Mo, um, she was also somebody who had a very specific studied point of view about image. And um, it, she's very well documented beautifully. All of these uh, characters are really well documented, but then to tell the story, you kind of have to have a jumping off point and make it cinematic and make sure that, you know, you're following the script and helping to support the story. So. Absolutely. And, and I want to talk about editing as well with you, Joe, because when you take a step back, this story is so much about reframing this moment in history and in people's minds. And, and through that, it's, it's interesting to look at every scene and what is the perspective of that scene? What is the character that we're focusing in on? And so as you were editing and going scene by scene, what was that process for you in finding the tonality of that particular scene, but also really thinking very specifically in terms of character and where you wanted to be drawing our eye in any particular moment? You know, is it Martha that we're following in this moment? Is it John that we're following in this moment? Sure. Yeah, it was it was a really uh, fun challenge. They shot uh, everything. The All eight episodes were block shot. And so I was working on three of those episodes at once, basically, uh, throughout production. And, you know, really getting into the performances. I mean, the the words on the page and the performances that I was getting, the dailies I was getting was were so strong. But you had three major arcs, you know, you have the arc of Martha and and Mitchell and the arc of the Deans and and Gordon Liddy. And all three of them are are really interesting stories in balancing those um, and we would we would, was a, a really fun challenge um, because you kind of can take there's a lot of different ways you can take them, uh, you know, tonally uh, in terms of how dark or deep it goes or how how kind of funny or big it is. And almost all of them were good choices. You know, any 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 direction made an interesting scene. So it was really fun kind of honing that in. We would, myself and the other two editors, Franklin and Lauren, um, Franklin Peterson and Lauren Connolly, uh, would screen our, our cut scenes every Friday. Um, at just whatever we had gotten done that we wanted to screen. It was really helpful just for us to watch each other's work and, and to kind of like start to understand some of these characters by, by looking at the totality of the arc the, the, of what was happening. Because we're really just getting puzzle pieces. Um, and... I mean, it's, it was a great, great fun challenge to to kind of fi- figure out the beginning, the starting point for Dean and where he gets to and where he gets to with Mo and uh, and and where Liddy goes is is just incredible. Shay, I'm just I it was so such an honor to get to cut the, your work. Uh, and and yeah, and, the, and of course, like Julia Roberts and Sean Penn doing the Mitchells. I mean, each one of these things was was just so rich um and you know balancing the tones of them and getting to work with mac um and 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 to kind of like figure out where where these things sort of landed um where what world they were in and how they connected was uh just just really fun yeah it sounds it and it's it's so fascinating to to watch the the final version of all of that and then in terms of cinematography larkin um you know 
every other people were touching on this a little bit that it is a period piece, but it doesn't feel overtly like it's in that moment. You know, it feels like we're just kind of watching in on this story that happens to be taking place in that time and setting. And so I was fascinated in it, in how a lot of the visual language of the show was constructed because it's very much about more naturalistic lighting sources, you know, what the color palettes are doing in terms of that. Um, but also within that, you had different lenses for different characters. And, and I was interested in how that lent itself to the period element of, of the extent to which you wanted to push that and what informed the different lens choices that you were choosing for characters. Um, yeah, we, Matt Ross, very early on said that he didn't want us to make a show that was trying to be in, in the 1970s. We, we wanted to make something that was set in the 70s, but didn't exist in it. Um, and so what we did is we, you know, we built a, a look or a LUT for it that was literally based on the film stock or the curve of the film um, from back then, which you'll notice is very contrasty. And the, sh the blue in the shadows is like a dark cobalt blue and not a cyan you see in say Transformers or every modern film. And that was our big push. And then Dan built like phenomenal 360 degree sets that had fake backings of photographs and like all the sets you see and everything outside the windows is a hundred percent there on stage. Like even like when they're in like the Howard Johnson looking out at the Watergate, that was a backing that Dan had made. And so it allowed us a lot of freedom to shoot 360. Um, and the other big element of the show is that as opposed to making a show about Watergate, we wanted to make a show about, um, you know, the losers or the people on the other side of it. And it was more of a, a show about the humanity of these people that are villains. Um, and a part of the, the, the big choice we made was to shoot three cameras. So we had to basically build beautiful sets, but we also had to find elegant ways of doing it. And the big choice for that was to do practicals and natural light. As Shay knows, we always had two cameras going and if not three, and we loved cross shooting because you have, you know, some of the best actors working in the industry right now in scenes next to each other and they will change a scene between takes. Like it'll be funny, that will be sad. It'll be extreme. I mean, if you watch anything of Liddy, no, there's probably six versions that we shot. You know, Shay would actually pause scenes and say, stay with me, stay with me, and then literally do a rewind motion and go again um, with a different take on it. And it was really exciting and fun. And because we gave, you know, the actors the freedom to really perform, um, it made all the three cameras, all the extra work worth it. So the, the visuals, like, well, they were a big choice was yes to have different lenses but the bigger choice was to kind of create an environment with dan to let them actually you know do their job and have fun and and, and do more than just hit a mark um but back to the original question uh <laughs> the lenses we kind of based around contrast and the more villainous the uh the character the more contrasty the lens so Sh shay had zeiss super speeds which are more vintage lenses um that had a much higher contrast ratio or an edge to them something was off um, as I said before, Shay also had his own lens, um, <laughs> which we called the Liddy, which was a 27, um, which was a, from a different set, but that was the only one. And Martha had slightly older lenses, um, either Pancros or Canon K35s that were softer and lower contrast. Um, not to necessarily soften her image, but to just to make, to make the world around her a little more murky or blurry um, as things progress. And then the the other choices were also the lens sizing. So like the characters that were kind of con in constant, like under pressure, like Dan Stevens or Betty's, they were tended to be wider and closer up. Um, but a lot, the big thing too was, was um, working with Dan and, and finding lights that fit all the characters. Like all the lighting is different throughout the sets. Liddy's lights are kind of low and murky and, and warm and over the top. Anytime you see him in his basement, there's something kind of sweaty and something brewing in there. And then, you know, with the Mitchells, it's these big, broad sources to kind of play open the emptiness of the spaces and, and the idea of what it's like to be alone. And then Dina Mo, all the lights are really close and intimate because there's actually a connection there. Um, we kind of played it, we played it up and we played a lot more practicals with them. And I love all of those sorts of specific details. And, and Robbie and Amelia, you know, coming back to a lot of the writing on the show, what's so kind of 
textured with these characters is that you get to look at all of these characters and what does it look like when they're backed into a corner you know who who are they going to be when the world around them completely combusts you know and obviously you've got someone like Liddy who kind of like holds on to this version of reality within himself even at the beginning of being in prison before he eventually has that that mental descent for himself you know John Dean kind of handles pressure not great you know and then you have but it strengthens his relationship with Mo and then you have you know the Mitchells where it kind of completely tears and eradicates their relationship because of how he responds to things and what that does to the two of them and and so how did you kind of want to approach each character individually to take them to that place of tension and find what their breaking point was and then who they become in that sort of instant uh, amelia go ahead mm -hmm. uh i i feel you know i i guess it's on the subject of afflicting the comfortable and comforting the afflicted uh and also on the subject of like writing a great character often means taking uh, someone who's feeling uncomfortable in their in their world and then flipping it or or like you said kind of painting them into a corner and seeing what they do at that moment you know we have a lot of a lot of scenes where characters are running out of uh, running out of moves you know we have um, James McCord being interrogated we have Hunt's uh, being interrogated by our Lano and Magianis, our FBI agents, you know, who are trying to get to the bottom of this this Watergate thing, you know, and and by the end of it, realize that maybe these guys that they're tracking aren't quite as intelligent as they they've assumed they are. Um, you know, we have we have Dean who who is a he's a climber. He's a he, he sees himself as kind of you know at the top of the world, and by the end of the pilot, has to admit that he's never even met. Richard Nixon and and you know that was it was a choice that we made we we really like to have characters out of their element it's the place where you find really good fun character work and then Robbie can speak to kind of creating the characters themselves I think and personalizing them which is something we really like to do yeah at the beginning of it all you know the first thing I did one of the first things I did was you really focus on okay you know, you focus on the structure of the story. I knew that, you know, the crumbling of Martha's relationship because of complicity, because of the complicity of John Mitchell lasted the length of Watergate. I knew that the bonding of John and Modine also spanned Watergate. And I think there's a really interesting crisscross in there, right? Like, uh, I really love a, a movie called Husbands and Wives by Woody Allen that starts with two, two couples that crisscross and they end up at different places at the end one is getting divorced at the beginning and the other is staying together and then by the end they crisscross and I, it, that structure really said something to me interesting about you know what complicity does to people how it combines some people together and it could tear some people apart and it could mold some people into different people like it does with Liddy um, and 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 how cruel history is to some people like Martha who are truth tellers and how randomly uh, generous it is to some people like Dean who is a truth teller who happens to be white and male and attractive um, and and you just start there and then you go one of the first things I did was okay so you decide on all these characters and then you have to look at what do they want why are they trying to get that thing you know, all Martha wants in the world is for her husband to choose her over Nixon. That's it. That's driving the entire story, even before Watergate. It's all she wants. And so there's a natural um, storytelling uh, escalation where, okay, then you, there is going to be a culmination of that want. And, and you're looking at who they were really are in history and and you're kind of trying to, to sift that out and sift out what that want was. I mean, from your point of view, and for, for Liddy, that want is to, is to come face to face with, with, with terror, with the, the terror at the center of him, his own weakness, and defeat it. And, and Liddy, I think in the course of the show, ends up that, that want and that desire to go to that heart of himself takes him from a soldier at the beginning of the show to a prophet at the end and an actor at the end and and what you there's a natural culmination point to that and, and and really once you start looking at each character's wants their inner wand and how they're going about it you know dean wants to be close to he's an opportunist he wants to be close he, he wants to be close to those in power 
once you look at what they're willing to do to get there, you, you kind of see these, these natural and I, I don't know, it's kind of a metaphysical thing how once you find that that want in these real historical characters, you kind of can pick out the patterns from their lives that, oh, this was the natural combination of that. Mm -hmm. Martha's argument in episode seven with her husband is the natural culmination of her want, and it really happened. Liddy in jail was the natural culmination of his want. Liddy went through many trials in jail. I exaggerated a few of them, but like that really happened, you know, Dean's really happened too. Dean got what he wanted in the, in the end. He got all the fame and the attention he wanted just from a place he didn't expect Hollywood. And so, he really did have a, a neon sign that said fuck communism. He so, really did have all. a neon sign that said fuck communism in his own. So especially with the, now, if we're doing a fix, entirely fictional story, we'd make those things happen. Just we'd make them happen. But with this, it's like sometimes history only needs a little nudge or figuring out to figure out where those points were. Absolutely. And, and speaking of Liddy as well, Shay, you know, I was really awestruck by the performance that you gave in that moment where we get to see the complete breakdown of, of Liddy when he's in prison. You know, you take him in just a handful of scenes from a place where he's being strip searched alongside other inmates and he's kind of making a, a snide joke to the guard in that moment to someone who has just completely lost all facet of themselves, um, you know, in trying to combat a rodent in, in a cell by themselves. And, and it's also really incredible because you're playing all of those scenes by yourself in an enclosed space. And it's such a huge character arc and trajectory in what's actually a relatively short amount of time to play to it on screen. And so how did you approach those scenes and really finding where you wanted to take that descent to and, and the evolution of what that arc needed to look like to get there? I'm having a panic attack as you're talking about it, right? <laughs> Going back to that place that 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 ten days or whatever it was, it was it was um, it was very difficult. Very very. What what you see here, Myra, is that it, this. It, I was there. You said by myself, but I but I wasn't. All these people and all this thought that you're hearing, this intelligent thought. I mean, because when I approach something, I I never know what it's going to be. I never, I always say to Matt or any director or Shazette, whoever it may be, don't tell me what it isn't. Let's see what it can be. You know what I mean? So all that Susie gets in there with me and Susie knows we've worked together. And I'm like, I'm not, I don't, mm. she goes, well, hold on, let me come back to you. You know what I mean? Larkin, I knew the first, when we had a difficult, difficult scene that had to travel in a, a supply closet in the third episode. And it, it was, it's tricky stuff. Because Liddy has to go from here all the way to say, I will take a bullet for the calls and I will be on that corner if you want to shoot me through the forehead. You know what I mean? So, and Dan sets. And by the time I got there, it was so much support. And I knew where we had to take it. Um, and, and it had to be true. It had to be true to Liddy uh, to have that existential battle with that rat. Or he, he didn't know until the very end when he goes, when he, he sees that it's true to him. It's just, it, it, it's, a, it's a collective. And I hadn't been supported. We, I say not me. I never say me. We hadn't been supported as actors by a group of, from the writing to Matt Ross, who deserves a huge amount of credit and all these, all this group here. I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty overwhelmed, you know, listening to everyone talk, to be honest. We haven't had a group talk like this and it's, there's so much thought and it just makes me whenever I take these kind of characters on so proud to, you know, to, to, to see it come to fruition. It's, it's amazing. When, when Shay would do these insane scenes with this rat, I remember <laughs> me and Amelia sitting in video village and just blown away. And then Shay would come over after he did it. It was like, how was that? Was that good? And we would just be like, we didn't know what to say because it was so good. <laughs> mm. Well, we, we, to be honest, like it was all practical. We had we had real rats. We had three different. We had rat trainers, and we had rats that I was working with and holding. And one one was this, one was trained to to come up to you and let me hold it and pet it. One rat was trained to scurry, and so Larkin would have to be. 
<laughs> and then one was one was trained to come up and eat out of your hand like so we would it, we, i mean it was the specificity with which this and then i had to stay in it i you know always staying in it i never want to i don't want it to feel false if i feel false or i'm winking at, especially in that in seven if i'm winking at the camera or i'm if i'm not really there it should be visceral experience for you you know to feel what i'm going through never me and so we had the real rats and we'd have them. It was, it was, it was magical. I, I, I hope on, you know, when people see it. It is. And, and lastly, coming back to you, Daniel, Joe, Mac and Susie and Larkin, you know, Joe was touching upon earlier, the block shooting of the series. And, and it sounds like it was block shot by location um, specifically as well, which I thought was a really interesting detail. And so I was interested in how that informed the way that you were approaching certain things, because obviously then cinematography wise, you know, you're filming scenes that have very different trajectories close to each other, similarly with costume production design details, you know, for you, Joe and Matt, you're working with parts of scenes rather than full episodes and then kind of building it out further and sometimes recontextualizing things. And so I was interested in, in how block, block shooting by location really influenced and, and shaped a lot of the process on the series for you all. Goes first. Uh, I don't know how much block shooting we ended up doing. I know for the editors, they were kind of block shooting, but we had a, a surreal schedule snag in the middle of, of production, just like a scheduling issue with some talent. <laughs> and um, we ended up having to restructure the whole order of events. You know, we started shooting deep May and it's like the opening car scene that runs through the city was day 96 of the shoot. Like the, it was, um, I'm, sure, I'm sure as editors for the show, it's very surreal to be like, all right, here's, here's where you're gonna have your footage. And then all of a sudden halfway through the shoot, it's like, so you're gonna have all your footage by the very end. I'm not sure if anyone actually got everything by it, but for the most part, we, we tried to shoot out sets, but we had like, you know, some very big sets that we built Martha's apartment. Um, we were supposed to finish and then we ran, ran into a scheduling issue. And then we had to wait like a month and a half to finish shooting her set. To shoot um, one day on the set or two. To shoot one day on the set. Just <laughs> the that there. Um, just because of scheduling. <laughs> um, but but overall, we, you know, the, the what made it work really well is we actually got the proper amount of time to prep it. And we really location scouted everything on this, which I think is sometimes rare in television. Now we got to like, we spent a long, we spent almost all of our prep location scouting because all this place had to be so specific and cover a vast array of like, you know, a Republican fundraiser to like, where do you find an orgy penthouse apartment from Miami and Los Angeles? And the answer I believe was like Riverside condos. Um, like it was a, it was a real mix. Of, of finding events but yeah that's that was my take on block shooting which was it started out great and then it kind of went into chaos which still worked out we just had to reschedule everything my take is i will never ever work again without my own lens larkin <laughs> <laughs> block shooting didn't really affect the music I, I mean i got to i came to some of these little uh, screenings that joe mentioned every friday to watch the little pieces that have been cut and I just kept had to imagine what was going to come in later because it was all in, in fragmented. Um, but I got to work in earnest once episodes were starting to come together. Shooting was was essentially done. And this doesn't normally happen. But the first piece of music that I wrote was the first piece of music in the series, which is the scene with Liddy uh, in, in his first um of many great monologues throughout the series while holding the, the, his hand in the flame uh, to prove that he's macho. And, and Shay, I also have to tip my hat, like I'm just amazing, um, amazing performance. And, and that scene, uh, you know, really got me started on what was gonna be a tone that would expand to the other characters, but just this sort of this serious, because uh, Liddy was taking himself very seriously. But there's it's a little absurd as well. So I, the music was serious, but with a little like, OK, this is this is kind of crazy. So, um, yeah, that was that was my entry into the whole the whole sound was that first that first Liddy macho scene. Remember when I asked for a real flame and everybody freaked out? <laughs> I said, I want a real fire there. And everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love I loved getting kind of pieces and puzzling it together. It allowed me to really um, like find my way into the characters, find my way into the stories. Um, there are a lot of scenes that 
that I spent a lot of time on in the first uh, that were the first 50 days or so of of the shoot that I ended up actually going back and doing a lot of recutting on once I got towards the end. And by the end, um, I got, you know, I was working on the the first episode and the seventh episode. So I had like a lot of beginnings and a lot of climaxes um, kind of happening. And I got almost all of it. I got so much in the last two or three weeks, uh, like all of this stuff with Liddy in jail, all of the, the big fight between Martha and Mitchell, the first scene where with John Dean in Mitchell's office, when he says he'll be, uh, you know, he, he can, he can help get Liddy to help you know, do this as this uh, surveillance work. And all of those scenes came in. And, and so I had so much of the rest of the show and I had already cut so many of the scenes and so many storylines and characters that I was able to really kind of zero in on these scenes. And, and especially like my, my priority at that point was to try and get the first episode right. And then the crazy thing was then we were trying to finish the first episode and, and the, the first four episodes and I was still cutting the seventh episode, which was just operatic. So every time I got a moment, I like, on, on weekends and stuff, I was going in and just trying, I was, I was with Liddy, like in, in the jail cell, or I was um, doing this, you know, intense fight between Martha and Mitchell. Um, so it, it was interesting, it, it, it was interesting, you know, you kind of go down the rabbit hole when, you know, just like everyone here, you, you get into the material and, and you, and, and you immerse yourself in it. And, you know, I'd come home kind of weird sometimes after my my lady, <laughs> and I'd I'd like have Wagner playing in the car and stuff. It was, it was a very strange experience, but but incredibly rewarding ultimately. <laughs> yeah, for, for me, the block shooting um, it's just part of the process for for me. You know, I read a script, it, it, it goes in my head, and then it, then it comes out of the schedule, and those are the puzzle pieces, and the puzzle gets fragmented. It just spreads out all over the world, right? And then it's part of my job is to link them creatively, like for, for what I have to do. Um, the time it gets frustrating for me is when certain blocks, certain environments have to have a transformation. And if those can stay in order, then that's, that's good. But if, if that gets out of order, it gets whack. Like, like the apartment or the Mitchell apartment had a transform transformation from the beginning to the end. And um, that was important. That's, that's often better if it, better for all departments if it can stay in order, right? Th those can stay in order. Same thing with uh, the prison cell, that type of thing. But the block shooting, I, I, I like to keep it all in one, get, get the work done, get it in the can and send it to, to Joe and, and do his thing, you know? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm so astounded by all of the work that all of you did creatively on this series. It was such a pleasure to watch the season and really appreciate you sharing all of these behind the scenes details of what went into making it. So thank you so much to all of you. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you, Mark. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.